Buongiorno amici, buongiorno amici, welcome to a new video, uh, you know, dedicated to the art of experiencing art, because experiencing art is just as important nowadays as making art, uh, and it's just as uh, not encouraged. So I would just like to uh, promote the pleasures of being interested and involved and having a passion on the arts by just talking about it. I'm currently in Brno, but up to a few days ago, I was in Carlo Vivari, where I, uh, you know, I attended the Carlo Vivari International Film Festival, and I covered it for Fred Film Radio. I interviewed uh, quite a lot of uh, filmmakers um, and just guests who attended the festival for Fred uh, Film Radio, and you can check out those interviews at Fred uh, FM forward slash UK. All of, the, all of my interviews from Carlo Vivari are there. And if you like, you know, there's my interviews for Carlo, from Carlo Vivari, from the Carlo Vivari International Film Festival from previous years that you can also check out. Uh, because this was my landmark fifth edition. So, you know, I've been doing this for a while. But um, I just wanted to talk about an experience that I had while I was there. And I wanted to formulate a thought about it. And... Uh, one of the things that took place at this year's edition of the Carlo Vivari International Film Festival was a retrospective of the works by uh, the man who was regarded as one of the most important, if not the most important, Egyptian filmmaker. I'm talking about uh, Youssef Shaheen. Um, and I, unfortunately, I mean, they showed quite a lot of his films, but I only had time to watch one of them. And, that, and it's the film that is best known uh, of all of his works. And for a long time, it was an international audience's only window to the Arab world. The film that I'm talking about is Cairo Station. And uh, it was released in 1958. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was quite successful. And although it was selected as uh, the Egyptian entry for the Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards, it wasn't actually nominated. But still, it gained quite, it gained a, a bit of a reputation. And for a long time, as I said, it was a lot of people's only insight, visual insight, accessible insight to the Arab world. There's a lot of fascinating things about it, and uh, this film has also been discussed by many theorists over the years, but they sort of, most of them stop at one point. And it's a very obvious point, and it's a very boring point. So I want to use this film as a way for me to illustrate that there is more to the artworks than, uh, than we, we sometimes think or we st sometimes stop to reflect. In the age of the internet, all we, c all we have to do really is click Yes, yeah, with a few clicks, you know, with a few Google searches, we can understand a lot more than theorists in the past did about any given film. And so I'm going to try to illustrate that uh, about Cairo Station. Now, Cairo Station is a film that I must admit I hadn't seen before, um, uh, before, I, before I saw it a few days ago in Carlo Vivari. And it was a great experience. I mean, just to start us off, we're gonna, I'm going to just give you a, a brief run through of the synopsis itself. The film revolves around this, this man called Kinawi. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, but if I'm not, I'm sorry, and uh, this is the way that I'm going to pronounce the name from the rest of the video, so bear with me. You know, It's very hard to get the pronunciations right, especially when I'm not editing the videos. This is all, you know, it's almost like it was live. It's almost like I was in front of you talking with you. So, Kinawi is a, is a, is a young man who basically is just a homeless man who lives at the station, at this Cairo station where the film is set. No one really takes pity on him, despite the fact that he's obviously, you know, he's, uh, he's lame and uh, he's got mental issues. Except for this uh, newspaper, this man who owns a newspaper stand there. And he gives him a job and finds him a place, a hut where he can live. That's, that's, that's him, you know. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, there's another woman who is named Hanuma who works at the Cairo station. He se she sells soft drinks uh, to the pa train passengers. And he becomes obsessed with her. Right from the get-go, we're introduced to Kinawi uh, uh, as this man who part of his uh, personality, part of his, uh, 
Part of his character is his frustration, and it is a sexual frustration that he has. He's obsessed with this, this woman named Hanuma, who, uh, who is one of those women, I mean, she's a woman who likes to dress in very nice clothes and show off her body. She's very flirtatious. She wears jewelry. And she, you know, the men know how she behaves. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Kinawi has a fascination with her that is definitely becomes an obsession. And this becomes clearer and clearer as the film pro progresses. Despite her behavior, she's engaged to Abu Siri. Abu Siri is a, is a luggage porter who also works at the station and he's a man of some importance. Uh, I had this thought while I was seeing him trying to set up this union for the workers of, a sta of the station that he's, not just, that he's also important because people know that he, is, um, that he actually has, possesses, because we're talking about possession here, uh, uh, the, the most beautiful woman uh, working at the station and that is Anuma. Possession of beauty, as I will argue later, is uh, also a means to have status within an environment. So, uh, it's not enough to possess it though, it's also important to control it. Basically, Kinawi's obsession for Hanuma is also, uh, it, you know, tragic, because we know that there is no chance, there is no hope uh, that he will in any way ever, uh, you know, marry uh, Hanuma, or in any, in any case, you know, that Hanuma will never re reciprocate the love that he has for her, apparently. So he's frustrated, and this film really revolves around this entire, his frustration. It's, a more general, it's more general than that in the sense that it doesn't only specifically talk about sexual frustration, although, you know, it is very important, sex is a very important component to the film, and for a film made in 58 in Egypt, it's actually quite impressive the way in which some of the shots are very explicit. It's almost like a later film by Bertolucci or maybe something that uh, Rossellini did. In fact, this film, one of the reasons I guess why this film was so popular outside of Egypt was that it almost, it has very European, the European influences are very evident in it. Um, it's not, I mean, it, it, but at the same time, it's a very deeply Egyptian film. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I got to experience uh, Egypt last year for the first time in my life and I was specifically in Cairo I had been invited there at a, at a film festival and I noticed that Cairo is possibly the most frustrating city frustrating city in the world at least out of the ones that I've ever been to and that's simply because you know uh, I mean I have I live a very European life in the sense that time for me is just you know I have to get stuff done all the time but in Cairo it seemed to me that there's a different concept of time and I guess when you know when you're in a place when it's that hot all the time when it's that the temperature is so unbearable you really have to take it easy but for me it was very hard to adapt to it uh, there's other frustrating things about Cairo but essentially a lot of that frustration uh, for me in the way that I experienced Cairo and I guess in the way that many people have spoken to experience Egypt in general is that it seems very difficult to get things done there. Um, so frustration is very much an Egyptian thing and you find that at the, in the final act of this film, in the final act of this film when it all comes to a climax, when, uh, when tragic things are about to happen as a result of Kinawi's obsession with this woman, something involving a crime, something involving a possible murder and so on, and things need to be resolved and there's a rescue that needs to take place. People are looking for others, uh, for something, you know, and nothing, you know, stuff gets in the way. And uh, there's all sorts of things happening that just get in the way of anything, of, of them resolving it, of the rescue taking place. And uh, that's a very Egyptian thing because uh, unlike a Hitchcock climax where, um, most of the time, you know, the suspense is generated by just a succession of events that happen, that actually do happen, uh, sometimes parallel uh, to one another, two events happening at the same time in different settings, you know, and so on, which is kind of the traditional way in which suspense is generated in the climaxes of a lot of thrillers. Uh, in this film, it's actually the suspense is generated by things not happening, things that should happen not happening. It's just a lot of people just giving up, being lazy, being stubborn, you know, there's a fight erupting and it's like, why are you fighting when there's clearly something that needs to be done that you guys don't need to have to do that. But this frustration is also a comment on masculinity itself because um, 
as I will get to it later, gender is an, is an incredibly important aspect of this film. Uh, so Cairo Station, as I said, uh, was was a very successful film uh, outside of Egypt, at least in so far as it was one of the most successful films to have come out of the Arab world in the in the in the late fifties. You know, it wasn't very usual for international audiences, except especially Anglophile audiences, to see films from Egypt. And at the same time, it must be said that there weren't many films that could be palatable to an international audience that were produced in Egypt at the time. But Shaheen was a very intelligent person and his awareness and sensibilities in cinema also were influenced by international cinema, especially uh, the neorealist films um, that had been made in Italy before. In fact, uh, any cinephiles out there encountering Cairo Station for the first time will probably recognize elements of obsession by Luchino Visconti, which is uh, often uh, credited as the first ever neorealist film uh, in it. In fact, you know the present, the very presence of the of the train station uh, is actually something that the two films have in common. Um, all right, so without getting too stuck on the film itself, I wanted to also mention how people are talking about it to this day. Before I do, maybe I'll just have a little vape. It's live, you know. Um, it's not live, but it's almost as if it was live. People basically, the one thing that they discuss the most is the male gaze. The concept of the male gaze is one of the most prominent uh, film theories that have been kind of spread uh, by people that have been proliferated in film theories at least since the 60s when they really became famous, when feminist film criticism became a, became a really big thing through the writings of people such as Mo, uh, Laura Mulvey, who's still going strong nowadays. In, in a nutshell, the male gaze is this concept that what dominates our viewpoint of the world is essentially a, a gaze, a way of seeing things, a way of experiencing things that is dominated by a masculine perspective which often, if not always, places the woman uh, at the center of it, but only as an object, but only as an object. So it is, it's got a lot to do, an object that must be possessed, and it is the object of male desire. So it has a lot to do with female objectification. In fact, it has everything to do with female objectification. And so in this film, you could argue that there's a lot of shots of Kinawe, uh, Kinawe looking at himself, looking at uh, Hanuma, from a distance and just looking at her. He says very little thing, few things in the film and it's just him looking at her with this, with this gaze of pure desire, of wanting to possess the woman. And also the possession of Hanuma is a very vital aspect of the story because as I mentioned, Abu Siri, who is engaged to Hanuma, part of the reason I feel why he's, got so, he's so respected by the other workers in the station and why he is able to have an influence over them, which is seen by the fact that he's trying to set up a, a union for them, uh, trying to organize his co-workers into a union to better them, their working conditions, is also because he's, uh, he's, uh, he's engaged to Hanuma. And so, but not only that, there's a sequence uh, one of the main sequences of the film uh, where Hanuma starts dancing uh, uh, in a train while she's just, you know, she's given soft drinks or bottles of soft drinks away and she's behaving in a way that may, could have been seen as controversial by the workers in the train. Uh, he, Abu Siri, is called upon by the other workers to do something about her behavior, to tame her in a sense. And that's what happens, you know. Uh, so, it's not only uh, what Cairo Station suggests in this film, it's not only that you must own the woman, uh, but you must also be able to control her. Of course, I'm using these terms because I'm actually trying to be as clear as possible about the points that I'm making. And uh, sometimes my, my, I, I don't like to go around the terms, you know, use politically correct terms, but actually just say what it means. What the, what, the, what the implications of the, of the um, viewpoints of Cairo Station or any other art, artwork that I, that I discuss are, you know, without getting too lost in words and vocabulary. I'm quite able to do that myself just by not getting to the point. But again, you know, this being slow also hopefully will uh, prevent people from getting lost in my, my river of words, if that's even an expression. Mm. All right, so... Uh, that's the implication. The possession of the woman uh, and, uh, and the, uh, 
abilities to control the woman as a means of gaining and acquiring status and power. But what is it? But Kinawi is an outsider. Uh, Abu, as a result, Abu Siri is uh, one of the main uh, people uh, of, of power within his environment, the station. Meanwhile, Kinawi, who is hopeless in able to obtain Hanuma, is an outsider. So we very often see him uh, on the outside looking in. And there, the, this point is constantly implied uh, because we see shots, often in close-up, of uh, Kinawi's face standing on the outside of something and looking in you know or maybe he's stand, standing in his uh, in his own hut and looking out at the scene onto the pla the train station platforms or uh, even in, during the dancing scene while Hanuma is dancing in the train he's kind of standing outside and looking in through the window of the train so basically that's the clear divide between Abu Siri and uh, and Kinawi Kinawi is uh, is um, an eternal outsider but okay, so let's consider again the male, the male gaze. Something that perhaps isn't talked about as much when it comes to the male gaze is that the male gaze in its strictest and rudest form is not only the objectif objectification of women, but it is the objectification of young, beautiful women. Very often, uh, I mean, you could argue that another, a different kind of objectification occurs when it comes to women who are perhaps older and not as beautiful, sometimes taking the form of maybe a motherly figure. But in this sense, seen, seen as the film revolves around sexual frustration, it makes sense to kind of stress that point. That very often when we talk about the male gaze, we're actually talking about not only the possession or the objectification of women, but the objectification of a young and beautiful woman. And that is made all the clearer when we see the woman making a show of herself. Uh, so very often, for example, in film noirs, you will have these scenes where the woman is performing maybe a musical number, you know, she's a nightclub singer. Think of Gilda, for example. Think of To Have and Have Not. To Have and Have Not is not strictly speaking a film noir, but you know, this type of movies, you know, where the woman makes a show of herself and grabs, captures the attention of the man. Uh, okay. So, if we look at it, at the male gaze, and get rid of the word female or woman f uh, for just the time being, we could say that the male gaze is essentially the possession of, of youth and beauty. But let's not get stuck on the word youth, let's get stuck on the word beauty. Right, so, the male gaze, in, the sen in a sense, is just simply, uh, you know, ab about the uh, objectification of beauty and the possession of beauty, but also the being able to control beauty, being able to keep an eye on it, being able to tame beauty. Hmm. All right. So why is this such an important aspect of it? Well, this is an important aspect because it allows us to get in really deep to Cairo Station and actually look at the behind the scenes story of the movie from a very personal point of view. We're not necessarily going to look at the cultural situation of Egypt, which is done in other writings, but I'm interested in a more universal message and, a more un and the more universal origins of the story and the film as a whole. Yusef Shaheen, uh, for Yusef Sa Shaheen, Cairo Station was his 11th movie, right? So he was kind of a veteran filmmaker, despite the fact that Cairo Station was really his first international hit, arguably. Um, but the interesting thing about Shaheen is that he admitted time and time again in interviews that he didn't always want to be uh, an actor. He wanted to be, no, no, he didn't want to be a filmmaker, I meant. He didn't always want to be a filmmaker. He, wa he originally wanted to be a film star. He wanted to be an actor, as most of us do, I suppose. Nobody when they're a child thinks of being a director necessarily. We all want to be the star. We all want to be the people who uh, the cameras actually point at because they're the people we experience. So we all want to be actors. We all want to be rock stars. We all want to be, you know, football players even, you know, they're on a stage of sorts. Uh, we don't want to be the director. We don't want to be the guy filming it. In fact, some, when we're children, we don't even think about the presence of the camera because it's a very naive perception that we have of art, you know, still. And it's actually a perspective of the arts that I kind of miss sometimes. And I, so, and I try to go back to try to return to because there's a purity to it, which as Pasolini would agree is actually beautiful. And that's where the 
it, that, that is able to connect with poetry itself better. Um, and the poetry of art better. All right, so given that, and why am I saying that? It's very important because um, Shaheen in this film actually plays the role of Kinawi. And this was the first time that he acted in, every, in anything, right? This was the first time that he, that he, not only that he cast himself in a movie in the leading role, but also one of the only times that he acted, and importantly, one of the first times that the camera actually pointed at him, at least in as far as I can see. I've tried to research here and there on Google. If I'm looking at the IMD page right now, chronologically speaking, 1958, he plays Kinawi in Cairo Station, and as far as I can also see, he didn't really play anything after that. You know, he had me might have had bit parts here and there, but Kinawi is his the film where he plays the lead role. There was other filmmakers, art house filmmakers so-called, that played roles in their films for one reason or another. Sometimes they, it wasn't just in one film. You know, Pasolini himself was in a, was in a movie. You know, we remember Truffaut being in a few of his movies. And, uh, but, but here it's very significant to think that, you know, he's playing the role of the outsider and the role of the, uh, of the man who's always on the outside looking in. And so considering, I'm, I'm going to, I looked into it and I, re, and, I, and I went to see what was it about uh, him that made, me re, that made him realize that he could never become an actor. And I came across a statement that actually said, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's out there. This is what I'm basing my theories on, so my theory on Cairo Station on, is that he realized that he wasn't good looking enough. This is true. This is actually a statement that he said. And I think he repeated it time and time again. The reason why he didn't pursue a career in acting and became a filmmaker instead was that he realized that he wasn't beautiful. So, going back to the theory that I, the reading of the male gaze theory that I came up, that, I, that I've sort of adapted for the time being, uh, the male gaze, as I said, and as I'm taking it in this formulating a thought on Cairo Station, entails beauty as something that is somewhat of a capital that can be exchanged for power, right? If you are not beautiful yourself, therefore, you must obtain beauty and you must be seen in the company of beauty, but it's not enough to just obtain it and possess beauty. It's, it's, you also have to be able to control it. So, uh, by placing himself in the role of Kinawi, a man who's constantly, uh, who's a hopeless outsider, who's constantly on the outside looking in. You know, we constantly see him behind a window or behind gates, you know, he's an outsider. And by looking at beauty from a distance, he is actually embodying the role of the film director. And so the role of the film, the role of the film and his role as a film director, his work in front of the scene and his work behind the scenes, his work in front of the camera and behind the camera in Cairo Station, is the reason why this film is so fantastic because that is the evidence of this fil film uh, being purely personal, a purely personal film. And if we return to the auteur theory, the auteur theory that was developed, you know, among others by Francois Truffaut, was that the best of films are the ones where you actually, where the, where the, the film director, the figure of the film director has the same power over a film that an author would have over his, his novel or his written work. Uh, and the reason why we can consider you, uh, Youssef Shaheen a truly remarkable director is that he could tie the social with the personal in a way that was very, that was so powerful. But the one aspect that is overlooked about this, it, what he does in Cairo Station is precisely this that the film is deeply personal and it talks about his disenchantments, his relationship to beauty and the way in which it prevented him from becoming an actor and adapting his artistic lifestyle and his creative energy uh, into something uh, that, that could allow him to at least gain the possession of beauty and control in it. But at the same time, and this is where it gets really interesting, within the film, Kinawi has this thing where unable to possess beauty the physical beauty that is represented by Hanuma, he uh, has newspaper cutouts of, uh, of women from newspapers. And it's actually, I believe, the same woman 
the same newspaper cutout. You know, he just grabs copies of a, a newspaper or a magazine from the newsstand and he finds that picture and that picture in his mind possibly resembles the beauty of Hanuma, which he is obsessed with, with who he's obsessed with. And he, he just cuts them out, hangs them on his wall, and sometimes he tries to alter them even, you know, he draws uh, with a pen a, a bucket, like, which is like the bucket that Hanuma carries around with the soft drinks in it. But it's never the same. It's never the same. So, with this comment, he seems to also imply that um, it's not enough to actually have the reproduction, the reproduction of beauty, to have that illusion. It's not enough to have that. You, you want to have the real thing because, you know, otherwise you're taken for mad, possibly, which Kinawi is. In fact, I would argue that Kinawi isn't necessarily ma mad. Like, he's, he isn't necessarily mentally ill. He's just perceived in that way because he is so distant from beauty. He's so distant from it and he can never obtain it. In fact, his, his, uh, his uh, cutting out of the newspaper, uh, of, the, of the magazine, of the photos of the woman from the magazine actually makes him look uh, frustrated. It makes him look even more mentally ill. Um, I mean, the, there's a parallel there between uh, the newspaper cutouts and film itself. Because if you're filming beauty, you're not actually possessing it. That's what he seems to... That's what he seems to um, say. You're not actually coming into possession of beauty. You may be controlling it, but you're still missing the possession of the physical beauty. You're only possessing an illusion of beauty, possessing a reproduction of beauty, but not the real beauty. So these observations on beauty, I think, is what actually make Cairo Station so deeply intense. The presence, the blurring of the line between uh, Shaheen, the director, and Shaheen, the actor, is just so much that it's almost like this film is more real than real itself. When you consider the personal motives behind it, and when you even imagine parts of it, you understand that Shaheen has always had a very complicated relation to beauty. You know, his realization of himself not being beautiful might have affected his, his everyday life, his own relationship to beauty. And that is why he is able to completely understand Kinawi and as a result, he doesn't paint him as a monster, as many other films would have, because he's obsessive and he's dangerous. That's clear. But he's not, he's, he's almost depicted as a child. He's almost depicted as this, this figure that we must almost pity. In fact, considering the other uh, characters of the movie that we get to kind of know, with the exception of the newsstand uh, man who t does take pity on him, he's possibly the most likable character. We don't really like Hanuma because we see that she's too attached to material possessions. We don't really like Abu Siri because um, he's, a, he's a little too power hungry and he's a little obnoxious. On the other hand, we feel sorry for Kinawi and that's connection enough and that's empathy. It's an empathy that is infinitely problematic, but it does make us think. It's, this type of experience, experiment was not new in cinema because if we can recall M by Fritz Lang where, the, where Peter Lorre plays a pedophile and you know the ending of that is a call for empathy that is so strong that to this day it sends shivers down my spine it's you know just thinking about it uh, but you know as a result what really makes this film special is not necessarily the observations that it makes it, because it represents the male gaze in the traditional sense right because it does you know but if you look beyond it it's not only about female objectification it's about actually having a problematic relationship to beauty, you know. It's actually a deeply problematic one that can be dangerous and that can be obsessive. Um, whether or not the conclusion of it uh, is, uh, is that Shaheen believes that you must use, you must live with that frustration and then it's impossible to just do without it, but you can use it creatively to make a film, that's, that, that could be true, but that's only speculation. What I feel really makes this such a strong portrayal of that obsession and that problematic relationship to beauty is precisely the fact that, you know, essentially Shaheen is portraying himself or an extreme version of his repression, you know, and his problematic relationship to beauty, which is personal, but also, you know, 
has to do with the outside world, but it also comes from a very personal place, the, re the realization that he is not beautiful. Um, that was kind of, uh, that's kind of it. How long did it go on for? Half an hour! Oh my god. It's, it's very hard to condense these thoughts into smaller videos. It's very hard. Uh, so, without further ado, that's, that, was, that was actually a half an hour video that I just shot. And I've got lots of work to do, but I decided to film this. On an Egyptian movie from 1958. And I'm going to be uploading it on YouTube. And uh, it's going to get viral. Because that's how YouTube works. It promotes this stuff, you know? It's like, yeah, let's, we need more art in, in our lives. We need to discover Egyptian films in the, from the late 50s. Why not? But uh, hey, so I hope you guys didn't actually look at my, weren't looking at me while I was saying these things because why would you look at a close-up of myself? I also have a difficult relationship to beauty, you know, but I have a very personal concept of beauty, I suppose. But uh, there you go. Hopefully you will actually have seen this film before you watch this video because uh, I don't want to put anyone off watching this movie. It's fantastic. The Cairo Station, Yusef Shaheen, amazing film. Uh, thank you very much for watching guys whoever got to the end of this video I mean I would love to know who you are so that would be fantastic if we could do that thank you very much guys keep experiencing the arts keep keep um, keep living the dream man and uh, so long